Hello everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian, and today we're sitting down with Jacob Ward. Hello. What's up? How are you, sir? So good to see yeah, you again. You too. I wasn't prepared for that. I'm not typically a <laughs> Yeah. Company. I was like, uh oh. <laughs> we didn't rehearse we can, that. We can also yeah, there was, that's good. That I can do. That's good. So that's many right. different ways that's to, funny. Yeah, to do a, a touch. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Exactly. That's good. I'm more of a this guy. Yeah. yeah Hello, exactly. Jake. Hello, Jake. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> So we're here with Jacob Ward. Uh, Jake and I met over a year ago. Jake mm -hmm. came on our science comedy show Eureka. Uh, Jake's background's epic. He's been journalist, correspondent with Al Jazeera, with CNN, mm -hmm. with PBS, author as well. Uh, definitely one of my favorite science communicators. Thanks, always, man. always making science relatable, asking the really good questions. I appreciate that. I love that. Thanks, man. It's so cool. I had a I had a funny uh, experience where I was. Um, uh, interviewing uh, the man who coined the term science communicator, but I didn't know it. Who and was I, that? And I was giving, yeah, so, um, yeah, now of course I'm going to blank on everyone's name. And this is going to happen for the next 90 minutes, which I hope <laughs> everyone really enjoys. It's me blanking on name after name. Uh, Baruch Fishoff is his name. Baruch Fishoff. And he's a psychologist and was a, and a very, very, just a really smart guy. And he was working for the National Academies trying to come up with very, he was coming up with all kinds of fascinating initiatives, smart guy, and he, uh, he was trying to come up with a term for what this is, you know, how do you make science legible to people, yes. and, he, and he was, and I, but the reason that I know this is I spent the first, like my icebreaker in getting to know him was how much I dislike the phrase science community. <laughs> I went off for a while yeah. thinking I was being all charming and edgy with him, and, and the truth is I think he didn't mind it so much, but but he he was like, oh, it's funny, you know, I actually uh, uh, helped to come up with that name. <laughs> I was That's like, great. oh, and he said that it was a matter of uh, he he didn't well, he thought that science it was something like science instruction uh -huh. was not the right or inspiration phrase. inspiration or too soft exactly I think for the National Academies, and so communication. science communication for him was the clearest way to say yes. it won't be. Uh, it's not instructional, it's not technical, but it is getting the important stuff across. But I yes. thought that was kind of cool. Once he described it, I was like, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. But I still yeah. think it's a lot of syllables. It's it a is, lot of syllables. exactly. Yeah, it's a mouthful. And th there is a more, in a nutshell, way to explain it. I think and so. And we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out yeah. over time. Stay what, tuned. What it is, exactly. There's a neologism for communicating yeah. science. I and like we're that. Gonna, yeah. Um, so I'm really happy that you're coming on a simulation because we are now pairing together leaders with these thought-provoking questions. Yeah. And we're really diving deep across a wide interdisciplinary array of subjects. And you're kind of the a really ideal guest for it. Thanks, man. And I kind of want to start by talking about what you're up to because I think sure. that will lead us into all of, the, well, all of the questions. Yeah, Alan, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. So you have a podcast out on Audible. I do. I have yes. a podcast on Audible, so it's called Complicated. It is, uh, the idea is that it is the humanity's most sort of pressing problems, biggest problems. And the conceit of a lot of um, media, really all media since the dawn of time, was to try to, you know, boil things down to their barest essence. And I was just finding in my, in, in you know, reporting uh, on science technology, uh, back when I was a, the editor of Popular Science and then, you know, through working at Al Jazeera and other places that, that, you know, when you really get into these, qu the big questions, the big challenges, everybody in the end just goes, oh, it's complicated. And you just <laughs> have to, you, yeah. and, 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 it, and I, and so I was trying to figure out like, okay, I can't sum this stuff up in three minutes. It's just not possible, especially on television. It's just not possible. And so, and so how do you get kernels of the problem articulated and interesting and the rest of it. You know, how do yes. you how do you leave some questions unanswered in a report and still get something important across? And so trying to sort of get the confetti all over the room is kind of the idea of that show. And so it's you know, it's everything from uh, opioids, you know, we were so one of the first uh, uh, people to really start thinking about that uh, back at Al Jazeera and then I got to do some of that with, with this. Um, uh, robot ethics, you know, big yes. problems. How are we gonna feed twice the people on half the land? Yes. All that kind of stuff. And so um, so it's been great. That's been a really fun thing. It's on Audible. It's behind a paywall. My apologies. But there's samples. That. But there are samples. You can listen to some. Yeah. And, uh, and if you, um, uh, hopefully people will listen to it. So uh, that and then um, I have a, a show. Can on we talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure, please, please. Let's, let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. let's do that because the, like you started off by saying that 
why is it called complicated? Because you talk to so many professionals yeah, about it, and after even a couple hours of discourse about it, oh, yeah. it oh, it's so complicated. It's so complicated. It's like nuanced, it's complex, totally. it's multivariate, and so we're always trying to calculate these dozens of variables that go sure. into not only things like feeding the population or opiate addiction, these kind of things, but even something like politics mm. and the e economics sure. and the state sure. of the world is not just some binary yes or no to immigration. Well, that's right. It's, and and yep. just because you have your, your finger on the dial of one of the variables, right, you can turn it up or turn it down, does not mean that that's going to solve the problem because any one of those that you adjust is going to change all of the other things, yeah. right? So with opiates, the, you know, opioids are, are such a, a difficult problem because you know, you're talking about real pain management for people, people who otherwise die in excruciating pain. Yes. We're getting a lot of relief from opioids. Like, that's not a, that's no joke. Um, but at the, you know, and, and at the same time, you know, I, I, I remember talking to these people at the Veterans Administration, uh, and they were like, you know, we have so many chronic pain sufferers. They estimated at the time that one in two of their patients, 50% of their patients were coming in for some form of chronic pain. And wow. you know, and so we were talking about. I was asking, you know, what's the, you know, isn't physical therapy a, a, uh, you know, a, a, it's been proven in many studies, or shown in many studies, to, that that it can manage pain better than drugs can. And they say, well, yeah, but if we, you know, if we tried to apply, they, she said there is not enough physical therapists in the world, uh -huh. or uh, certainly in the United States, to service all of the chronic pain sufferers that we have coming through the VA every year. Yeah. So that right there, right. You can't just then be like, well, we tied that one off, you know, yeah. <laughs> opioids, we're, now we get yeah, it. Exactly, you know, then yeah. you got to be like, oh, okay, well, why is the pain, why is that the case? And, and you know, why are drugs cheaper than physical therapy and yes. managed care? It just like, it sprawls and sprawls and sprawls. Exactly. So all you can hope to do, I think, in a show like that is to try to, you know, at least, you know, encounter some of the borders of the problem, maybe. Yeah. But you want to be in the position, I think, to be able to, s to to at least head off overly simplistic solutions to this kind of stuff. Yes. That's the thing that I think people are too... I, I wonder do. if maybe you and I can think of one of the best ways to address these complicated subjects. What is the essence of the best way to bring mm. a complicated subject to the masses? Because maybe there's, we start with a statement, and that statement tries to summarize the issue of, let's say, nuclear war or robot ethics sure. or feeding right. a question. world. Right. A question, and it kind of summarizes the uh, really importance of it, mm. the essence of it. And then after that, we kind of propose maybe one or two points about the the hard, the hardest parts about the problem, and then here are some of the one or two of the solutions mm -hmm. that are being discussed for these problems. Yeah. So I, I just wonder what could be that. Yeah, I think that it's such a. Uh, I mean, I think it's a it's a huge challenge. I think that you know, as as quaint as it is to say, I think that telling stories is the way that people learn. Yes. You know, I think people just that great stories are there, and and. One of the great benefits of the world that we live in right now is that it's possible to just to encounter so many different kinds of amazing stories. You can go out and connect to people yes. that, you know, 100 years ago we could never have understood anything about, you know. So the the interconnection of humanity, I think, can help you do that. So I, I, th I love going and finding, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think that the, the bad journalism builds a trend from anecdotal evidence. But if, but if a trend has been well established, some big scientific finding has been well established. You can then go in and show an anecdote that tells that yeah. story, and at least get people to understand what it is. I think with the, you know, um, yeah. so I don't have a good example of that. But I mean, I, I really like what you're doing here with these sort of formatted questions because I also think that you can. I, I don't know. I'm a big fan of that. I just like the way it's, yeah. it is when when people from you know when a wide variety of different uh, subjects are subjected to the same yeah. questions and the same treatment every time. I love Humans in New York for that reason. Yes, right? That's yes. super formatted notion. Um, yes, it's yes. one of three styles of portraits, and it's always this one thing. And, yes, and yes, I yes. love it, man. I can't stop watching that. So or, you know, yeah, that. good. So, that's good. Oh no, that's e not good exactly. Enough. We're designing the test track for the brilliant minds of the yeah, world. Yeah, I like yeah. it. I like yeah. it. Yeah, test track. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's the president's physical fitness test yeah. of, <laughs> of super interesting people. Exactly. Yeah, that's what exactly. I would hope. That's what I would hope. Okay, so, oh man, because 
I know there's so many that you discuss in Complicated, and I and I love unpacking them. Maybe maybe before we get to hacking your mind, let's sure. let's let's dive into one of the ones in Complicated, and we'll throw in a couple of the simulation questions into it as we go. Okay. What? Who's going to teach robots ethics? Oh, this is a good one. This is a good one. So, uh, so in Complicated, we did an episode on um, on you know military ethics and robotics and because it's a you know it's just a handy example there's a lot of activity going on in military robotics you know a lot of stuff to learn uh, we did not um, uh, interview this guy for for it but but one of the people that I met sort of in, in doing that kind of work was this um, uh, pair of researchers at Georgia Tech who are literally trying to do that they are literally trying to teach robots ethics and in the sense in the sense that they are um, they, they want the, the robots to learn from, uh, from us, our ethics, in the same way that kids learn from their parents' ethics, by reading them stories. So wow. they grab stories from all across the internet, they, they crowdsource human descriptions of things to then try to teach the robot, okay, what is, you know, an algorithm, what is the decision-making tree you should assemble mm -hmm. to, to do this mm -hmm. properly. And it's funded under an Office of Naval Research grant and a DARPA grant because what uh -huh. they're hoping to do in the long run is get non-technical people to be able to teach robots how to do things like program a VR environment for Iraq, right, and how it's supposed to look. And so you bring in, uh, uh, you know, you, you want to be able to bring in someone who knows an incredible amount of, about Iraq without them having to then also be a coder and just say, well, there'll be people over here, and this yeah. is over here, and you yeah, don't yeah. talk to women whose faces are covered, and no, 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 you know, or whatever the, the you know, the, you can teach the cultural mores of the place, plus, uh, uh, you know, you, you can really, you can draw on their primary specialty. Anyway, so the, the, that's the sort of the, the point of the grant. So they're trying to, so they were trying to create, like, uh, this, this computer program is called Quixote, and they, uh, they built a, a game that was basically bank robber, and they were trying to teach it to write scenes uh, of bank robbery uh, that would make sense to humans by learning those stories from the internet. So they got people on Mechanical Turk to write a simple 60, I think it's like a 60 word story about, here's how a bank robbery works. Mm -hmm. There's three characters, the teller, the cop, the robber. You can do this, you can do, each one has like a little, you know, a group of decisions they can make. And the robot at the beginning was just having the like the teller just like hand the money to the robber, and the <laughs> robber just goes marching out the door because that's you know the most logical way to yeah. do it. That's the way a robot would do would it. Do it yeah. And so then you you instead get uh, you you it began to learn and it began to figure out like oh okay and it began to write the thing where like the teller presses the alarm and here come the cops and the chase is on and you know it began to look like a Hollywood screenplay yeah. and you're like oh this is it. So. I was just talking to these guys about like how, how hard it is to do that. And they were like, oh man, it just goes on and on. You can't imagine how complicated it is. Like ordering a sandwich is such a complicated set of decisions mm. when it comes to this kind of stuff. Like getting yourself a sandwich within a shop for a robot, no problem. Mm -hmm. Jump over the counter, you get back there, you elbow the human out of the way, you know, you, you make the sandwich. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the goals that you can build into an algorithm are super straightforward. Yes. But instead, you got to be like, okay, wait in line. Don't cut the line. Yeah. And stand at the register. And yeah. even though the food's over there, you got to ask That's the person at the register. Right, and blah 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 blah. You know. And one of the things that they s that they say about it is that one of their goals is for the the robot to not appear psychotic to human beings, right? And you're it's one of those things where you're like, right? Because yeah. you know. So there's this whole, s you know, sub level of programming uh, of, of you know technical. There's a technical specialty in teaching people, uh, teaching robots ethics that it, I think is about to become like a whole Huge. profession, exactly. yeah, a thing, you know. So that's right, that's right. Which is sort of that's bigger picture. That's, that's what I'm interested in like, yeah. doing for the next like couple of years. Exactly. Like, you know, focus on that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yep. Gosh, I'm really happy that you kind of let us down that in again a very Sweet. nuanced way because okay, so check so check this out. You said that it, most people don't think about the complexity of walking into a line and then having to stand at the back of the line and be right. patient 
and to not just jump totally. through the as any make your as, as any parent knows, that's a hard conversation to have with somebody, <laughs> yeah. with a kid. You know, you got to be able to be like, no, 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 you don't do that. That's right. And so, yeah, exactly. So it's about programming the ethics of even something as simple as waiting in line mm -hmm. or something as simple as interacting with the person behind the counter in a way that's friendly sure. um, and in a way that is uh, efficient yeah, uh, because absolutely. there's a line going on. And so this was also interesting what you described was that there's different places in the world have different cultural norms. Sure. And because of that, then a artificial intelligence or a robot might need to behave differently oh, yeah. in those different parts of the world. Sure. And that that in itself requires the diversity of people from around the world helping the programmers mm -hmm. figure out, oh, well, when I'm in Europe, I act. When I'm in the Middle East, I act. When I'm sure, in Asia, right, whatever I it is. Act. Waiting in line means different things in different co countries. You go to other countries and the, the the rules about waiting in line are very, very different. You know, the English, they love to queue. They love to stand in line, you know, uh, and, and then uh, you go to other parts of the world and the line is, it's, it's basically like everybody fills any available space, <laughs> you know. It's like a, a fan Yeah, line, it's a fan know? line. Yeah, you know. Um, it's at the queue, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, but that, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You gotta, you gotta, so I think that's super interesting, but isn't it also interesting that like we're gonna be tr trying to translate that to algorithms which are going to then somehow make decisions that are going to change the way we, you know, stand in line. Will anybody stand in line if the algorithm sta can stand in line for you? You know, like, they're oh, going to be, exactly. it's, it's all going to, I mean, I don't know, it's all going to change. And yeah. so, um, uh, anyway, we can talk about you, that. You, you also brought up the, um, the complexity of how many people are now going to be working on figuring out how to kind of the, the whole Turing test mm -hmm, because mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. you don't want this robot to be like, may I have a sandwich, please? Mm -hmm, you know, you, mm -hmm. you, you want it to be almost indistinguishable from humans. Mm. And in the way that it behaves, in the way that the flesh vehicle looks, right. um, or maybe we want it to be a complete piece of punked metal yeah, 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 right, right, we right. can tell mm -hmm. but the difference right. is the research certainly shows so far that we do not want it to be too human right the uncanny <laughs> valley freaks people out like you get too close to it being a real looking thing and, and people oh, have to have a react to it, the polar express reaction to it like, oh god okay i want to ask you about this now we like asking about the geopolitical and economic race for artificial intelligence mm -hmm. so what do you think about the United States and China and other world powers mm. sl trying to procure the strongest code for the future, right. and where does that lead us? Yeah, so this is, a, uh, it's funny, I have many interests around AI, and that is, and, and you are, you've led me into the one area that I know the least about. I mean, I know enough, I know a certain, I certainly know everybody is attempting it. Everybody who has any kind of supercomputing Power and uh, you know and, and strong established traditions in the technical sciences you know is into it right now. Um, I think that the um, there are some very concerted efforts in certainly in China. You know they are they are the leaders of the world supercomputer race now and and you know um, you know are going hard at that. I think that it's it's going to be very interesting. I think the ways that um, you know AI as a sort of free market capitalist accelerant is going to present itself here in the United States versus how it's going to be used for, um, uh, you know, government support and the sort of pacification of the populace and all that kind of stuff in other countries, um, all of which is a form of sort of social control. And, and so, um, you know, uh, there are people, you, 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 I was interviewing a guy who's a, a networks uh, specialist uh, in, at Yale. He basically, you know, his, his lab studies the the movement of ideas across groups of people, networks of people. Mm -hmm. And he says that whenever he finishes a, a talk, this is not, not whenever, but he has had times when he's finished a talk and he's had somebody come up to him um, afterwards and say, it's so interesting what you were saying about how to um, uh, spread uh, certain ideas quickly through networks uh, in an effective way. Um, could you tailor make the message that gets adapted properly? You know, because he was mostly studying stuff like you know, water 
sanit you know sanitation, good hygiene, you know health, good, like healthy practices, trying to get that information across a network of people. And instead, this, these were people coming in being like, "How could we move things forward? You know, how could we move doctrine through the group?" And he's and he named you know a bunch of different you know that, that there are different countries. <laughs> the, the the person approaching him turned out to be a representative of a foreign government. You know, uh, typically an autocratic government looking for ways to do this. So, mm. you know, I think there's there's obviously the the horsepower is there for us as humans to figure out this problem. I think the next big question that everybody needs to get on top of now is what's it going to be used for? You know, who's going to be using it for what reasons? Yes, you yes. Know, uh, because as, I, as I'd like to discuss here, you know, like we are powerless to resist it if it gets our number right. Mm. You know, if it really gets the, the number of the human, the, the way that the human brain is, is built, which is how people are, what people are really figuring out right now, if people figure that out and then apply AI to it, man, we are in real trouble. Or, you know, we've got a really serious problem. So um, that's that's where my mind goes on that subject. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like the way that you see the next couple of years and why you're focused on this in the next couple of years is exactly why I think other people need to focus on at least having discussions about where we're going to go with this. Yeah. So, okay, do you, and let's maybe do one last question within artificial yeah. intelligence is, I love it. do you think that artificial intelligence poses an existential threat to humanity? So, this is one of the, the I, I think this is such, a, it's such an interesting question, and I think, so, I think that there was a version of, our, of, of artificial intelligence uh, as an existential threat to humanity that, that I don't know, the, the common thread, right, that I, that you see in movies and in, you know, people's writings and even notable people, Elon Musk and, and the rest, you know, have talked about is this idea of a sort of, a, some sort of external force enslaving humanity, you know, uh, a, a, a robot brain takes over humanity. My concern, and this is the thing that I'm working on for the next little while, I'm hoping to start a book on this subject uh, right away, is how AI is, is not going to create a robot brain that controls us, it's going to empower the wrong part of our own brain and control us through it. Exactly. That's what it's going to do. Yes. And so that's, that's my big concern. So I think it is an absolutely existential threat to humanity, but not in the way that people imagine. And we and have no idea how we can be manipulated oh. in all of these oh. ways that we have no idea. No idea. Totally yeah. unconscious. Uh, you know, the, the the ways in which you know, and and what's so interesting is when you talk to those so many very smart people coming out of AI who are realizing this right now that there really is a sort of a code book for human behavior. Mm -hmm. And hacking your mind. This show that I've gone on for yes is all about the sort of the, that, the way that that brain, the human brain is is built. Um, you know, even pre-modern people, all the way through to you and I sitting here, we all have the same rules that our brains mm -hmm. follow in making decisions. And mm -hmm. and the last 50, 40, 50 years of, of psychology has been teaching people that. So mm -hmm. uh, once AI learns those tricks, which yes. is not to say AI like some external thing, but instead when some marketing person through uses AI <coughs> using those tricks. Yeah. Suddenly we're going to be powerless. You yes. know, there's going to be I mean powerless is the wrong word and I don't mean to be fatalistic about it. I think we are we're about to sort of I think we need to undertake one of the greatest media literacy campaigns in the history exactly. of, of the world. You know, we need to yeah. really get into some uh, smart information training. It's uh, crazy we're you know. already seeing a little bit of it oh. with the bots that are on the sure. internet that are sure. pushing certain content into echo chambers and stuff totally, like that. Totally. Yeah. All the, the, all of the automated stuff on uh, uh, Twitter, you know, the political disinformation stuff that you see, you know, that stuff is just using the most simple rules of propaganda yeah. to, to mess with people, right? You know, stuff written in the 80s by, you know, all kinds of different people. There, there, there's, a, there's an amazing Polish uh, study, and maybe I can leave it in the comments here, that's super interesting about, that's a, from this, this think tank in Poland that is a, it shows how, you know, back into the 80s and 90s, Russians were were preparing, you know, the, the highest levels of Russian academic and policy making were preparing the doctrines that are now being executed by these hordes of, of Twitter bots of, you know, find subjects that make people emotional, mm. drive a wedge between them using it. It's the best way to destabilize yeah. your enemy. You know, this is pre-internet yes, kind of writings. You know, exactly. And they're just doing it. You know, this is just yeah. this is part of the deal. And that's the most crude form of that stuff. I think when you get into things like, um, you know, we could, we, we I don't want to jump 
gun here, but the, you know, the, the, the unconscious ways that, um, that our brains register emotions from one another and pick up the emotions from one another um, is so systematic and so totally unconscious in us. We, you know, when you make a, you know, a snake comes in here, you and I leap to our feet, exactly. we are out the, out door, the door, with, door with looks of horror exactly. on our face. Everybody in the room gets the sense that something's been terribly wrong exactly. without even thinking about it because it's all instinctive. Yes. And uh, it turns out that you and I transmit emotions yeah. with, with unspoken, unconscious communication between our faces. I go yeah. freak out, you go freak out, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Yep. That's why when you wink, the, you know, the other person can't help but wink back yeah. at you. Yep. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, on the ride over here, I was looking at the ads for, for the iPhone 10. you know, take a selfie, everybody take a selfie, unlock your phone with your, with your face, you know, all that stuff. You know, they're about to amass this enormous database exactly. of how exactly. humans register emotions on their faces. And, wow. you know, that's a, yeah. sure, I, I consider Afi Apple a pretty ethical company, yeah. but, but I don't know that it should be up to them what they choose to do with that, with that data. You know, that's, an, that's a really <coughs> powerful thing. So. Once the algorithm, you know, can identify microexpressions, and, is, and in 2015, a, a paper came out that said yeah. microexpressions uh, can be read better by a robot than it, they can by yeah. humans. Boom. That's trouble. Trouble, you know. If I'm going to look at my phone, it's going to yeah. know how it'll do to to talk to me in the in the language that makes me feel register the emotion it's after. You know. I think this is a perfect segue into hacking your mind. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. You just described that within artificial intelligence, one of the ways that we could potentially be impacted that is very not discussed too much is that there is a whole myriad of information about me that exists on the internet already. And just for an AI to parse that information and then to be able to send me an email and just say like, oh, hey, Alan, by the way, there's this thing that I now know about you and right. without a choice. I, I have oh, yeah. no choice oh, then. Yeah. I, I have to do what is being asked of That's me right. because they know so much more about me than that because of all the information I've put out over the last whatever ten years. Just even, walking around. Just walking around. Yeah, right. So so with um, maybe tell us a little bit about hacking your mind and yeah. how that applies. Yeah. So hacking your mind, I, I uh, can't describe too much of it because it's still still we haven't finished it yet. But it's it's a, um, a National Science Foundation funded show about human decision making and the, and the, sort of, and the, the science of, of understanding behavior in humans, the decisions we make. And the big word, the big operative word is bias. Yeah. Because in science, they, were, they use that word not to describe just discrimination, you know, uh, mm -hmm. racism, sexism, the rest mm -hmm. of it, but just the shortcuts that your brain takes when it goes from one thing to another. And our incredible ability to, as I was saying, you know, when a snake comes in the room, we just leap up and go. Exactly. We're biased, you know, the, our biases are, t are giving us the power we need to just get the hell out of here because there's a snake on the floor. Um, and those, you know, the, the theme of the show is essentially there was an amazing amount of ancient programming that has kept us alive for millions of exactly, years. Exactly, yeah. But now we're living in a world uh, where you know we're doing things that our ancestors never tried to do. You know, for tens of thousands of years, we have never, you know, voted for people we've never met or tried to police mm. one another or you know these things that our brains are not built for. We're good at danger avoidance, pattern recognition. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, snake detection. Yeah. You know, we're good <laughs> at that. You know, yeah. we are not good at being fair. You know, hiring uh, the right mm -hmm. people. You know, we those are totally modern. Uh, mm -hmm. creations that we're just not built for. So the show describes all of the amazing science that came out of people like Daniel Kahneman, Amos Tversky, Baruch Fischoff, mm -hmm. uh, there's another one, Paul Slovic, all these people. There's this whole cast so of, awesome. of, of amazing men and women who have Do you bring them onto the show Yeah, as we well? get to talk to all amazing. of the top people, and they're incredible. Amazing. They're incredible. And their insights are, are you know, they, they... So cool. They're so smart, and and the ways that I mean, and what's cool about the show is that I get to be the guinea pig. You mm -hmm. know, like you want to see, you want to learn how mm -hmm. unconscious most of our decisions are. Mm -hmm. You know, try taking those experiments and failing, or failing, you know, performing in exactly the same way that everybody else does, and you realize, oh my gosh, you know, I I really do have an unconscious preference for people in my age group, or yeah. you know, uh, people who look like me, exactly, or, you know, whatever. Just so, for me, the 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 impact of that show is understanding how unconscious and powerful our decision-making apparatus really is, how much I have been deluding myself <laughs> yeah. about the choices I thought yeah, I was making, making yeah. and then exactly. what that means in the context of a world of Facebook, a world of Trump, a world of Brexit, a world of all these things. You know, there's just a lot, a lot of stuff um, that 
that you know happens when we try to run a democracy using this ancient apparatus. <laughs> and so, um, so it's great. I mean, it's a, it's been an amazing, amazing experience. So, out of that, um, we finished production on it, and and uh, we're in post production now, and and waiting to hear when it's going to air. But supposing in 2018, and we're really excited about that. And is it a weekly? Will it come so out it's weekly? Four one-hour episodes. Okay. Four, and they're Will like big. Come out big monthly. Yeah, I don't. I, you know, I think. Okay. So funny in this day and age. I'm, on the one hand, I'm like, I'm, you know, I, I, I think it will probably be weekly, but I don't actually know. I have no idea. Yeah, on um, PBS. On PBS is the idea, okay. but we don't know yet. That yet, but but that's the plan. Hopefully um, on YouTube or. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, is that, well. And then it'll be it'll be available. Publicly, exactly. You know, out there. And great. And it's great. It's great. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm so fired up about it. I'm oh so my gosh, me too. Yeah. Uh, so. I think this is just the start, really, with hacking your mind. I, I hope think, so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. so. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Uh, actually, Daniel Kahneman's book, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, yeah, was yeah. one of the most cool reads, probably yeah. that I've that I've ever it's had amazing. a chance to. Yeah. He, the bat and ball yeah. uh, problem yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and the, the thinking fast and slow. So uh, in, this is good. I'm sure. Did he did he ask you that the bat and ball cost a dollar and ten cents? <laughs> he didn't know. He his so Kahneman uh, um, is sort of the like. Eminence Grease of the of the show in the first, you know, little while he just is sort of the he's just explaining the big fundamental principles they bumped into. You know, he and his partner Amos Tversky, his his colleague, they worked super closely together. Uh, Tversky then uh, unfortunately died of cancer in '96, but then but then Kahneman went on to win the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. uh, and in economics as a psychologist because yeah. that, because that's <laughs> what really really smart people do. Um, and he he in his Nobel speech. When I would have been like, yeah, I want a Nobel Prize. <laughs> He's like, here's what I'm doing next. <laughs> you know? and, he, and he described his interest in this idea of a dual process theory exactly. and that there had been all these people working on this idea that we have a, an unconscious mind that makes most of our decisions for us yep. and a conscious mind that just rarely, rarely gets involved. Yeah. 17 um, times 24, mental math. Yeah, like, yeah, no. Okay, I have to slow down. You got to get system two involved in that. System, and, yeah. and system one is, yeah. is meanwhile, you know, driving your car, yeah, you exactly. know, buttoning your buttons for you, exactly. you know, making so, the food, all that stuff. Yep. Um, so, uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, his, his, he's sort of the center, the center of the show. Or the sort awesome. Of, you know, that's awesome. Oh, that's it's awesome. so great. Yeah, it's super, cool. super I, cool. I love that question. And for everyone at home that might not know it yet, it's the, the bat and ball, a baseball bat and a baseball cost a dollar and 10 cents. And the baseball bat costs a dollar more than the baseball. And everyone immediately goes, 10 cents, that's how much the baseball costs, it's 10 cents. Uh -huh. But it's not 10 cents, because 10 cents plus a dollar and 10 cents would be a dollar and 20 cents. So, right, right, right. So you're, you have to break it down. Okay, well, a base, the baseball would be five cents then, because the baseball bet's a dollar and five it's cents funny. together right. is a dollar ten. So, and there's so many cool questions like that, that we can see ourselves jump to the conclusion right. without even getting the chance to process right, slowly. Right. He, that's right. He and Tversky were basically trying to explore the ways in which people, when they're when they're people who are not given enough information, and are strapped for time or yeah. other resources, yeah. what shortcuts do they take, you know, yeah. uh, to to try to solve complicated problems? And what they found across, you know, all these different th thousands and thousands of people per experiment, and their work has totally held up and been substantiated mm -hmm. and recreated by other people is that we all do very similar things. And they begin to break it down into these various specific biases, of heuristics, you yeah, know, these, exactly. these patterns of, yeah. of, of behavior. Um, and, you know, what is so amazing, I, I just love, you know, when you begin to see those and, and see the pattern and then look out in the world, you're just like, oh my gosh, wow, right, that thing, yeah, sure, you know. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, I saw a I saw a chart of all the biases. Yeah, there's a great shorthand chart. Mapped, and mm -hmm. it's just massive. There's a whole sort of. There's a whole so world of it, yeah, and they're pulling branches. them in from all these different people. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the one that I, I love is uh, the, um, there's a hindsight bias, and, um, uh, Baruch Fischoff, who I mentioned earlier, uh, did this amazing work on asking experts um, ahead of an event the likelihood of a certain outcome, and then after the event, uh, uh, how confident they had been that it, it, how how likely it was that that thing turned out that way, the Vietnam War ending the way it did, Nixon.
Nixon strip or yeah, Nixon strip to China, like mm -hmm. you know, and and he found that across all these different people, we not only so we, we consistently overestimate the likelihood of things that happened. So when my daughter says to me, Dad, how could you not have guessed that? It was so obvious, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's that kind of thing. You're like, you're like, oh, you know, I, I am overestimating how likely it was okay. that, that the Axis won, you know, the Allies won World War II. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then it turns out also that if you then ask those experts to go back and recall their predictions, they consistently underestimate uh, or overestimate how likely it was for that, or how likely they said it would be. Yeah. So they overestimate their own talent at making predictions, is, which yeah. is amazing. And yes. so, and once you look at that, you're like, yeah, that's how I've lived my entire life. You know, like I've totally, you know, and that's how yeah. human beings are like, you know, we are total amnesiacs about, about, you know, we don't learn well from the past is basically like the lesson of his mm -hmm. research. You know, that's, and once you, once you sort of, I mean, what I love is that there's for me the process of doing this show is like is there's this there's you there's this resistance you have when you're told this stuff about yourself you know you're just like no dude I'm not like that yeah yeah I'm not like <laughs> that you know no way <laughs> no way but in terms you know and then and and then you get in there and you're like wow I did exactly what all the other humans did <laughs> this is just like how people are oh my gosh and for me the, the, it turns out there's a whole research body of research that shows that. As human beings, we love a, a visual illusion, right? You and I love the funhouse mirror that changes yeah. our, you know, body, or um, the one where it looks as if it's following you. It's it's an indented face, right, yeah. cut into the wall, right, and it looks like it's following you as you walk by. We people lo are delighted by these by visual illusions, but the second you explain to somebody their cognitive illusion, illusion. they're like, oh, wow. "F you, dude! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, get out of my <laughs> face! I'm not like that." You know, we yeah, are deeply so defensive about that, and so you throw you throw uh, AI into that. I mean, that's yeah. what I want to look yeah. at next. Yeah. You throw AI into that equation, where we have this incredible capacity to be overconfident about our own decision making systems, while relying on a totally unconscious system that follows really specific rules and can be gamed by a yeah. smart enough algorithm. I just think, man, we're in real trouble. Like, we got to yeah. get out in front of that, you know? Yeah. So, got to discuss it as humanity. Yeah. Come up with some sort of general principles around what, what kind of a future we want to build right. with it. That's right. So, y I, you're so right, though, about visual illusions and how we're like, ah ha ha, oh, that's hilarious. tricked me. That's but right. then, as soon as we're like, here's a cognitive bias that you experience every single day. Uh, it's like, oh, what I do? Are you sure? Yeah. Like, uh, here's a, here's a place where those things intersect that I thought was really interesting. So there are these there are these um, vision researchers who were looking at. So forever, people have been exploring these dual process ideas. That the idea that that your 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 brain is uh, is receiving certain information unconsciously and certain information consciously and reacting in different ways about. It. So here's 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 the example. So uh, in, in World War One, after World War One, there was an Austrian neuroscientist, this guy, this guy Otto Putzel, um, who was a you know a neuroscientist back when you could not an image anybody. You know, you really were like mm -hmm. cutting open people's brains yeah. or doing all kinds of crazy tests yes. on them. <laughs> um, and in this case, it was right after World War One where you had your choice of all manner of crazy, crazy injured uh, injuries and and their mm -hmm. their effects on people. So in this case, he was studying people who had, who had been shot in the head or suffered some sort of horrible damage to the head and wound up with, with uh, areas of their eyesight that were, were blacked out, you know, so big blind spots in their vision. And he was, mm -hmm. and he was experimenting with uh, what they could see and not see. And one of the things that he would see or, or what he found with it was there was this one guy named Objut, I think was how you say his name, he was a veteran. He'd been shot through and had this perfect black, you know, uh, blackness in the middle of his vision, and only had peripheral vision. He could describe it. Oh you know, wow! He was definitely, yeah, he was like, you know, had been terribly wounded. Mm -hmm. And uh, Putzel would put uh, a pic pictures in front of him and, te and test him out on them. And one of the pictures uh, was a bouquet of flowers, and uh, like on a table. And he was like, I see a room, but he couldn't see the flowers. Then he goes to the next picture, which is a, a little portrait of some people, and he says, I see a group of people, and the man in the middle is wearing a, an enormous bouquet of flowers pinned to his lapel. And, and Pozzo goes back, begins to study, uh, do this of giving him sequences of things, and was, f and was finding that, that images from one 
picture were arriving in this person's consciousness when looking at another picture. And he developed this whole idea of the piecemeal delivery into consciousness. I don't know how to say it in German, but that's mm -hmm. what he was mm -hmm. investigating, that our consciousness is, is like a train, you know, disgorging passengers and they all go to work, you know, and then when they get to their desk, the day begins. But every, all the imagery takes a different train into your brain. You know, uh -huh. and, and, and when the system is damaged, then they start to not arrive on, the sa on time and it all gets messed up. So, so the, the, that finding then led to all these other findings about like the unconscious uh, delivery of information from your senses into your brain and the sort of piecemeal yeah, delivery into yeah. consciousness. So with... Um, Which can really easily be explained as you walk down the street. Yeah. You probably don't even really register uh, people's faces right. and what they're no. wearing or the buildings or the cars anymore. That's you right. kind of just see little icons and right. stuff. Right, if anything. It would be <laughs> like your brain, what your brain's really doing is like, do to do do to do 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 You know, like you're doing this, you know, in, in there <laughs> while you walk. I mean, that's what all these people are finding. And, and you know, there was then a, a group of visual researchers who figured out um, that if you, if you take, in fact, that same thing where it's that illusion of the face cut into the wall and it looks like it's following you, if you put um, you know, let's say it's cut into this wall here, right? Mm -hmm. If you put a, a, a little dot inside there, let's say a picture of a fly that looks as if it's on the nose of mm. the person in there, mm -hmm. and you ask someone to flick it off, <laughs> so they, they, it's crazy. They, they will, you know, they'll totally register the illusion, be like, whoa, that's crazy, it's totally fooling me. And then you'll ask them to flick it off, and their hand will go directly inside, will reach oh. inside and perfectly flick off the, the fly. Blink without even thinking about it, which means that they determined that there was an unconscious second system, visual system, for, for gauging space. And they call yeah. it seeing for doing and seeing for, se or it's vision for doing and vision for seeing or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, yeah. that, so that thing of, of having an unconscious experience of reality, you know, and then this incredibly limited noony 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 kind of yeah. you know, conscious experience of reality are two totally different things. And like you described, well Robert Sapolsky's book Behave really mm. goes into mm. deep detail with this as well. It's right. just that it's been evolutionarily programmed into us yeah. via our nervous systems right. for so damn and, long. And thank God, right? Because yeah. that's why you and I get to sit here together. Like otherwise I mean, you know, my wife yeah. and all and I always joke about the amnesiac like the <laughs> that you know that human beings w you know when they're considering whether to have a second child a lot of couples will be like you know that wasn't so bad the, and the wife you know the the woman will especially be like oh that wasn't so bad you know um uh you know the birth that wasn't so bad you know and we were and we've been we make this joke about how there's a l an, a long ago evolutionary branch of the tree that remembers Agony really and well, exactly. really well, and was like, no, we are not having Never any more any children. children. Maybe we won't even have any children, and they're they're long dead. They, you know, they died out long ago. You know, and here we, you and I are the amnesiac, yeah, noony noony people yeah. that that we moved right on through life. You know, never even thought about it and kept reproducing. Yes, you know. But and then there was also the but honey, we need another three workers in the field at the farm, right? And all that right. stuff, right? Oh, okay, so um, that, okay, so let's. J that's amazing. Hacking your mind. I'm just so pumped for yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Thanks, uh, man. Th yeah, I mean that that's probably one of the most under research areas because we love the brain but we don't like admitting we're wrong or biased and so that's mm. that's going to be really exciting okay let's let's go into a um a complicated question about the brain let's Sweet. go let's go into uh do you think that what what is consciousness mm, that's a good one so uh so consciousness let's see i so i i i don't no, my, my answer is complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> but let's see, what I would say is um, because there's been all this really interesting work on, on our conscious brain and our unconscious brain, and these two systems, mm -hmm. a system one and a system mm -hmm. two, one thing that I think is sort of, for me, useful for thinking about this stuff is the point at which our higher cognitive functioning, our higher reasoning, what these psychologist Daniel Kahneman and the rest would call system two, you know, it's our creative faculties, our logic, our reason, uh, you know, all of that stuff that allowed us to make and harness fire and, you know, mm. make lights and buildings and those yeah. clothes we're wearing and yeah, all that yeah. stuff. 
um, is very recent. That system is incredibly mm -hmm. recent in evolutionary yeah. terms. So yes. we've only, you know, we, our, our, our convergence with, with uh, monkeys evolutionarily goes back m tens of millions of years. Mm -hmm. And so the system that we share with them is that old, mm -hmm. you know, at least that old. Mm -hmm. And as a result, has had so much time for evolution to do its thing and refine it and improve the code and make it better and better, you know, and make it more and more foolproof. Yeah. Whereas the <laughs> the human higher reasoning thing, people think we've only really had for probably like 70,000 years, you know, mm -hmm. when we first came out of Africa and yeah. spread around the globe, whatever that dawning of our brain exactly. was that made it happen, started eating meat, all these other things happened, you know, that made our big brains possible and off we go, you know, I find myself thinking maybe that is maybe that's consciousness, you know, maybe that's the consciousness in the way that we think about it. I love but then, that. But then I also think about, you know, uh, I got to spend some time with with monkeys uh, in this incredible habitat uh, uh, called Cayo Santiago in, in Puerto Rico, which was mm -hmm. ravaged by the hurricane. And if anybody wants to help them out, please do. Cayo Santiago, Monkey Island. They. Um, you spend you can spend time there, and it's twelve hundred rhesus monkeys that are just they're the only people on the only beings on this island. Whoa. You hang out, there's just like thou you know they're just everywhere. Yeah, and they're amazing because they're in these little tribes, and and you know you can sort of hang out with them, and, and you know you look at that animal, you spend time with that, and you can just exactly the consciousness is there. I mean, yes. obviously it's there, yes. but the researchers would point out that that they those animals do not. Uh, they cannot transport themselves into the experience of another one of their kind, and that that's the big one of the big distinctions between yeah. humans and monkeys. So, a monkey could never in a million years go sit in a movie theater and cry mm. at a movie about other monkeys. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, it mm -hmm. can't imagine what you are like having come here today. Mm -hmm. You know, from a different route than it did, or whatever it is, mm -hmm. or imagine uh, what life would be like without the skill that it's had or the group that it's had, whatever it is. So. Yep. Uh, the researcher, uh, Lori Santos, who's this fascinating uh, researcher out of Yale, um, she, she says, you know, that when she goes to yoga, <laughs> people are like, um, you know, calm your monkey mind, put exactly. away your monkey mind, whatever. Yeah, yeah. She's like, no, man, it's not that. It's the human mind that's getting in the way. The right. monkey <laughs> mind is chill. She says she has all these stories about sitting and eating oh, food on a, on a bluff with a monkey and just being like, this is the chillest guy I've ever mm -hmm. hung out with. This is yeah. cool. So, so I, I don't know. I think that, that I think that consciousness has to sort of run the gamut there. Mm -hmm. You know, spans both mm -hmm. of those experiences. But um, you know, uh, do you, do we need that system to to be conscious in the sense mm -hmm. that we think of? You know, to be a person. Well, what is that level exactly of yeah, consciousness? Because yeah. we see it in even our dogs, and sure. uh, and then we we see some sort of emotion and consciousness, and then we see some in. Like you said, I really appreciated what you said about the evolutionary split away from monkeys. This, the, the, because I think that is an increased level in consciousness is what it sure. is. All the examples sure. that you listed. Sure. And then furthermore, building computers and buildings and rockets and all this other kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so besides like em emotions and empathy and, um, and that kind of stuff and understanding suffering, um, right. There's also the the technological advances. So, do do you think that it's localized in the nervous system? Yeah, anatomically, I mean, so the the the, uh, I I don't, but I also know. I mean, I then think where that where would you think? That? Well, I mean, you know, I just think that we have such a rudimentary understanding of how the brain does its thing, and and the, you know, there are there are researchers who are still showing that that you know vision may arrive at the brain via multiple uh, pathways such that even if the main one is severed as in the case of these people that Otto Putzel was like working the optical with nerve? yeah so there's this amazing researcher Beata Gelder at, at Columbia and she also uh, uh, is in the Netherlands she she's studying a, a condition called blind sight which is incredible and so people who have lost the connection between their visual cortex sorry the visual cortex and the and their their machinery for seeing and basically a stroke has produced a lesion that cut it off. Mm -hmm. And she's discovered all this incredible stuff about, you know, where, she, where people are, she'll bring in somebody who is blind, totally blind, you know, says, I'm blind, walks with a cane, whole mm -hmm. deal. And then will test them. And there's this one famous piece of, of video where, where a person picks their way 
But basically, she takes the cane away from this guy and says, uh, and that sounds worse than it is, invites this man to walk down this hallway without his cane. And he, and they've set up a little obstacle course in front of him. This is a blind man. He's been accompanied there by his wife. You know, he cannot see. He stops at the first obstacle. He edges around it, steps around the next one, goes down the hall, like goes around another thing, gets to the far end of the hall, and everybody is freaking out. Everybody's like, <gasps> how did you do that? To which he responds, do what? <laughs> he has no idea that he avoided all this stuff. <laughs> and she's showing now that there is, there is, that that part of the brain that is, r that is somehow registering these obstacles in the path is also controlling, has executive motor function, is controlling motor function without this guy having any idea that it's happening. And he gets to the other side, takes his cane back, and thinks that he's just sort of like got lucky walking down the hallway. You know, so, so uh. the fact that we don't even know how stuff arrives mm. in the brain that way makes me go, I don't have any idea where in the brain that would be taking place. Or if it know. is even Yeah, here. is it one place <coughs> or is it a web of things? There's the, and then there's the recent one on Minefield with Michael Stevens that I really liked where they linked up an AI to the EEG mm. and then had someone press a button and then it would read when the signal came that they were going to press the button and they would light the button up red and they had to try and press it before it before turned red. Before knew it and was going to do it. And wow. They couldn't, and they, couldn't, they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. That's amazing. So of course, great, yeah. of course. Yeah. Oh, man. So, so it's just, so it's, I love, I love consciousness and I love the That's conversations amazing. about what, about the le different levels and stuff. And I, and I even like, uh, hypothesizing about what it will be like when we are even you know one percent genetically superior than what we are now mm. you know what will that increased level in consciousness look mm. like mm. Uh, yeah. yeah yeah I don't know that one I don't know that one I think that for me there's a whole transhumanism field that I'm I'm yeah. trying to be hip to and I just don't get I don't get it yet quite I have trouble decoding people's motives about that I think and that's probably mm. what brings me up short but oh I get to, I get in, I get into I don't know. I I I, I, uh, I seize up. In, well, with the, in what's that your world biggest a bit. Uh, qualm with uh, transhumanism? Kind of like decoding wh why people want to merge with machines. I just think it's. I just I just don't believe that human beings are, are mature enough about death to really be having that kind of conversation yet. Like the, you know, we can't even talk in any kind of straightforward or clear way about our the end of our lives, and we're already talking about like cheating death. You mm. know, and and handing ourselves off to, you know, to, to a platform, uh, you know, mm. I just go, mm. we can't even, we can't even get our, our heads right about, you know, when is the time to die and how do I take care of an elderly parent and, mm. you know, I mean, we, we can't even do those things yet and we're already talking about handing ourselves off to robots. So for me, I'm just like, ah, I'm not quite ready for that. Let's solve these other point. problems first. Yeah. That's my first thing. You know, and, and it just, and it doesn't help that it tends to be the very rich who talk about that idea, you know, and, and the, the very rich and the very technically savvy. And mm -hmm. I go, ah, I don't know, man. Like, I don't know that, I don't know that you guys are the, are the ones Okay, that we have, now we have to talk about this. Yeah, let's go, around. let's go. Is there a global ruling elite? Oh, oh, I like that one. So. Uh, sure, yes. You know, I think you could look at the cast of characters that show up at Davos and the rest of it, and I think, yes, there are certainly, there are certainly human beings that, that have amassed outsized influence over everybody else. Certainly in economic terms, that's true. You know, I, I, the stat that blew my mind uh, and, and has become, I feel like I want to, like, tattoo it is the wrong word, but I want, I, mm -hmm. I, I have it with me all the time because mm -hmm. it has, is totally transformed. I wonder if it's the same one that's in my mind right well, now. Well, I wonder, I wonder. So in my, mine is a Pew study found that 49% of Americans, which is 50% of Americans, one in two, could not get their hands on an extra $400 in an emergency. 400 bucks in cash. They can't get Half that. of Americans can't get an extra 400 bucks. Half of Americans do not have an extra $400 to spare at any given moment, which means. Holy cow. They have to borrow it from somebody, a family member. Holy or cow. You know, yeah. put it on a credit card yeah. or go to a payday place yeah, or yeah. whatever it is, right? So one in two. Wow. So for me, you know, I just think that the the wow there's a huge number of people living. You know, paycheck I think paycheck to paycheck, paycheck yeah. to you know, and paycheck to paycheck doesn't even cover it. You know, that assumes there's another paycheck coming because we're doing yeah. away with those. You know, like yeah, some yeah. you know people are really really in a desperate shape, and yeah. I and so so for me, I I look at that and I think. You know, and then and then you go and then you see the people that that you know have tremendous influence in the world. People who hold 
you know, the, the, the one percent, as it were, you know, the, the contrast there is really, really, really strong as, you know, as they say, the, f the ceiling and the floor are really falling away from each other. Yes. And so, you know, I, I don't believe in grand conspiracies of, mm -hmm. of people. I think that no, you can't get three humans together in a room and have them really fundamentally agree about almost anything. And mm -hmm. so I think the elaborate orchestration of oh, stuff sure, is right. not as, as common as we like to think it is. But Although maybe the implementation of centralized banks well, could be. Right. With yeah. the right technology, you can make any coordination yeah. uh, like that. Uh, easier. You know, so that's right. A small, small groups of people can have outsized influence through technology. We know and that much. I'll tell you about the statistic that was in my mind was that the eight wealthiest people in the world now have as much wealth as the bottom three and a half billion. There you go. So that there was the go. one that was in my mind. And I think, I think you, the one you brought up is nuts as well. It's and just I think the it two really sides of the same coin. That's really people, interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, so that's, that's good. So now my the follow up to uh, the global ruling elite is should one endeavor to join the global ruling elite? Oh, wow. Elite? Uh, that's really interesting. I don't want to dodge this question, but I would say, uh, just to, I think I would sort of say that, that you know, what I try to do as a dad and as a sort of a human, I just remember when I was a kid, my mom tucking me in one night and, and saying, some of the happiest people I know are people who have really powerful, my mom is like a great influence in my life. She's like a, mm -hmm. a, just a really, really wise person. And mm -hmm. she said, some of the people that I know who, have the, who are most content in their lives are the people with a really strong local uh, uh, I don't think she said influence, but sort of effect on people's lives. And yeah. she was talking about bakers. She was oh. talking about school mm -hmm. teachers. She yes. was talking about firefighters, people who who can yes. experience the connection to other people and, yes. and have a, an ongoing relationship with those people. My mom, not not coincidentally, is a nurse, mm -hmm. and that is that relationship, mm -hmm. you know. And 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 that I think is is I think if everybody could have the opportunity to do that and have a little bit more than four hundred dollars in the ca in the bank, yeah. you know, at any given moment, that could be a really happy life, you know. And I think with with you know, being on track as we are for 11 billion people on this planet, you know, I think much better to put away the theory of, of exceptionalism and the desire to be in the top 1% or whatever it is and redefine, let's, you know, redefine what happiness is so that we can, we can actually have a good mathematical chance of enjoying ourselves, <laughs> you know, because we can have lots and lots of, of good bakers in this world. You know, we can't have that many people in the global elite. I mean, there's this guy, this researcher at the University of Alabama, this is, this is my tendency, by the way, Alan, to totally take a really upbeat topic and turn it super dark. So here <laughs> I go, ready? So <laughs> this guy, Adam Lankford at, uh, in Alabama, who has been studying mass shooters, and his, he's a fascinating person because he was connecting them to suicide bombers and trying to figure out what some of the psychological mm. sort of threads are there. Yeah. So with mass shooters, he came up with this theory that of sort of why it is that they are such a big deal in the United States because the, the rest of the country, you know, the rest of the world, even countries that have tremendous violence problems do not have lone wolf mass shootings like we do. And his, he came up with a bunch of different things. And that Pew stat was actually one of them. That's where I learned that was uh -huh. this idea that people are so desperate, but at the same time are being led to believe by media and their peers and, you know, uh, social and everything else that they're, to, to believe that they're going to become uh, part of the ruling elite, right? Mm. And he, he had mm. this study about, he, he trotted out this, this study, also a Pew study, showing that um, high school seniors, it was, the stats were unbelievable, like 25% of them uh, believed they were about to be famous, right? One in four believed that they were Whoa. about to be famous, right? So that's a big one. Uh, Whoa. Huge numbers of them, it's like half or something like that, were uh, expected to be, uh, were about to be, have a great paying job. Another, you know, 50% were, were expecting to have a better life than their parents did. Mm -hmm. You know, so this just out, out I mean, this unexplainable yeah. optimism that yes, they've been, yes. these standards they've been, they'd somehow thought they were gonna live up to. How could you not be disappointed under those circumstances, right? Yeah. And then he also can, you know, points out the incredible access to guns. So this thing of, exactly, of yeah. desperate circumstances, American exceptionalism, exactly. crushing disappointment, huge access to guns. Boom. That's where it goes. Boom. So, you know, it's crazy. Great. But the, great so for me, I think, I just think like he's identified one of the, you know, rather than how to get rich, let's all talk about, you know, how can we be happy and live sustainable lives with yeah. what we've got? Because yeah. the math on 
yeah. one in four of us being famous. It doesn't work out. No. You know, it just doesn't and, work and, out. And also the, as you described with the, I like to give the example of, you, you describe bakers and firefighters and people that are close to their community. Uh, I like to use the example of what's the purpose of purchasing a third yacht when you can mm. hire 50 people to solve a global problem? Mm. Mm. Because one of them is going to bring you. You run with a cool, a hefty more powerful crowd than I do, I think. Um, that's yeah, awesome. I don't, that's awesome. I I like don't think I like so. <laughs> I, think, I think I just come up with stuff like yeah. that and I, and I try and plug it in and I just try and see right. how people uh, react to it. and. And, uh, you know, and really on the 17th when we hosted Jordan Peterson, you know, yeah. his reply was that one of them brings a tremendous amount of meaning and fulfillment. Anyone of high competence mm. loves bringing and helping other people. They know that that is a major part of fulfillment mm. in life. Mm. And that's that mm. whole baker or firefighter community, teacher, right, nurse right. community. So the more people that you can impact positively in the world, the more meaning and fulfillment that brings you. And, and so that's one thing about endeavoring to join the global elite that I care about is because I want to bring that good to so many people, that meaning and fulfillment to so many people. Right. And I want to be a part of the trajectory of Earth and where we're going. I want to be a part of the bigger, higher level decisions. But like you said, it's crazy to see so many high schoolers thinking that, you know, fame or fortune or the, the th those are not actually the big things the impact is the big thing and, right and how do we help communicate that to young people that are using instagram and seeing all of the lavish stuff right. going flawless on. lives that their colleagues that their friends and peers are, are yeah. living that's right uh, yeah for me i think and i feel like th th this is not my area of expertise, and I'm still just trying to figure this stuff out. But like, but for me, I think I think it's just it's not trying to get everybody to have a huge, as big an impact as possible because that's a really loud world. Like I I feel like it's got to be that you get you know the, that you get a certain amount of satisfaction doing a certain amount of good for other people. It's like you know people I can't remember who it was, but somebody was pointing out on Twitter, you know that they feel really positively about not just the immigrants who have a, a you know a crazy amazing story about how they you know, a cured brain cancer or whatever it is, but it was something about, you know, like I like the ones who like to sit home and, and watch TV and eat some chips sometimes, you know, and like, yeah. and that's right, like people who just like exactly. want to be people, hang out, want to exactly. be people, like I, I totally, and, and that is, is the, the me media doesn't sell that, that idea, that idea they sell all. exceptionalism. Even though I think Exactly. We need to restructure. And when I say media, media, I'm also talking about me. me let me just too. let me just exactly. be clear. That I'm, that's me. I'm doing so that. So maybe that's there my needs fault. to be some sort of restructuring of media to I, to highlight that it's totally cool to relax and find fulfillment in just you know playing with your kid and yeah, uh, right. to find fulfillment. I mean, in this is coming. Somewhere. You know, th this is one of the things that comes up a lot in hacking your mind. Or sort of one of the lessons of the of the findings that those all of that 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 world of psychologists and researchers and behavioral economists, everybody has sort of come up with is that one of the big challenges that we're going to face is that the really, the, the you know, the, the most logical, the, the best thing to do to preserve democracy or to, you know, uh, maximize, uh, the, you know, your, your financial security or whatever it is, the thing that you should do feels the worst. It, is, it doesn't necessarily mm. feel good to do the right thing. It certainly it very often doesn't certainly doesn't make a very good story. You get a higher reward circuitry from doing something yeah. uh, short term dopamine reward versus totally. you're taking advantage of this executive functioning and saying right. I'm going to delay my gratification. It's a boring movie when you're when you're thinking <laughs> it through. You know when Neo in the Matrix says, you know, um, I know he's being held in a military facility and I know that he's surrounded by things. I know no one's ever come back alive against agents before, but I I. I believe in something, and they're like, "What do you believe in, Neo?" And he's like, "He's like, I believe I can bring him back." And that is the same narrative you see in every movie. You're hearing it from the president right now all the time. Like, I make decisions with my gut. My gut tells me what to do. I'm a gut kind of guy, you know. And that feels best. So you're, you know, you're, the thing, you're gonna, your gut is going to make the decision that feels best <coughs> to you. But it turns out that that's not actually the right decision to make, you know. Like the and the, and the 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 movie where Neo's like, "Let's not go in there. That's a really bad idea. We're all going to die." You know, nobody wants to watch that movie. And so over and over again, we're being conditioned by movies and reports and everything else to believe that we should be like, that we should be doing the thing that feels right, 
you know, when in fact the thing that feels right is very often the wrong thing to do. So for me, I, you know, that doesn't package up very well, and I don't know quite how to sell that as a credo. It's not a very good t-shirt. Like doing the right thing feels bad, yeah. you know, is not a good credo, but that's fundamentally what a lot of these people are, are discovering. That's what these psychologists are figuring out. And so what are we gonna do about that, mm -hmm. you know? We, we're so good at packaging good feelings, not yeah. bad feelings. All right, let's do a couple slightly quick quickies at the end. How, Sweet. how about? Can we do aliens? I'm so excited. Yeah, to do I, I also want to hear your thing about aliens because I don't know your I don't know your feelings on that subject. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, peanut uh, gallery's heard enough of your theories no, about no, that. No, no, I think keep so. going. All right, we'll I'm keep going. All right, you ready for aliens? We, ready? We were okay. we were right there, going right there That's right awesome. now. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, are we alone in the cosmos? Sweet, I love it. I love it. So, so uh, the math, as you well know, says, of course we're not. There has to be other, other beings out there. And you know the Fermi's paradox is the whole thing, right? There's, so, there's all these stars, the math should be that there should be somebody else. So I can't remember who it was, but there was some, some pair of, of you know, PhD students or something, I think in the Netherlands, came up with a great answer to that, to Fermi's paradox, which was, uh, sure, there, there, you know, alien life may ex be popping up all over the universe, but why should we assume that it would be popping up at the same time that we are alive mm -hmm. here on Earth? Yes. That if you actually look at the sheer amount of time yeah. that has passed, yeah. which is the one thing that humanity is, r one thing that, that the brain is really bad at grokking, yeah. is huge amounts of time, which is why nobody can, can get their mind around evolution. Yeah. Uh, we can't imagine like, oh right, there have been aliens, but they died out 20 million years ago, you know, or whatever it is. You know, they may have, you know, buzzed right by us at some point, but we mm -hmm. wouldn't know because we've been a alive for the equivalent of a match being lit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's how long we'll be around yeah. on this planet in the galactic, you know, the, in the, exactly. cent the actual scale of time. So, uh, so I think, sure, sure, but we may not be around to see them. We may never have the capacity to really understand, you know, to detect them. I mean, who knows, you know. Um, so uh, that's my that's my take. On so here, so here's a couple things: is that the amount of habitable planets that orbit stars in the right. habitable zone is about we approximate one in every five stars has uh, so about twenty percent. It's amazing. It's amazing. crazy. That's, that's amazing. in this habitable zone, and right. you know most stars are dwarf stars and smaller than ours so the habitable zone is closer to the planet right. so like you said that there's on this time scale that we could have had an evolution of bacteria you could have an evolution yeah. of some plants Who knows? you could right. have had an evolution right. exactly and right. so you never know the, the let's say an advanced civilization did evolve now let's say we are getting close to this advanced civilization right Fermi paradox speaks of all of the Fermi filters, so all of the different diseases or asteroids sure. or the diseases. Um, I like that movie. Mm -hmm. I'd watch that movie where the diseases come through, the diseases that come through to us from somebody else. Sorry, go ahead. And then there's a nu um, nuclear war. There's the artificial intelligence mm -hmm. Fermi filter. So there's all these different Fermi filters that prevent civilizations from actually scaling into the dozens of millions of years of life and right. and and colonizing other planets and stars. And so I love thinking about this question and all of the different levels of consciousness that could have evolved across all these different stars. But I, I do think that because of the vastness and because of the time scale, then there must be one that figured out how to harvest the power of their star mm, and mm. How, how to go and colonize other planets. Right. And so there's this whole like zoo hypothesis as well, which is that the advanced civilizations are observing the ones that aren't advanced and they're waiting for the ones that aren't advanced to do things like figure out how to travel at the speed of light right, or right. or teleport and as soon as they unlock that feature Isn't then they talk to them or whatever. I like that idea right it's a, I think it's no coincidence that that like there's this incredible promise of a great thing right around the corner in that idea, that which, is, which the human brain loves. We loves that. Love and unlockable. Like that. Yeah, unlockable. You know? yeah. Exactly. I just keep playing. Just a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. Unlock that thing. Oh man. You yeah. know, Unlock communication. Can't wait if you don't play with you know? advanced civilizations. Yeah. That's okay. Right. That's right. So I like that one a lot. I I think uh, the the other just the, the only other alien thing I would say is like the um, I really am interested in the the exoplanet 
stuff. And then yes. and I, my favorite thing to do is when they when the Kepler data generate you know coughs up a new one, is to then try to take the light year mm -hmm. distance and be like, okay, you know, with the space shuttle, how long would that take to get there? And Too looking at that long. so long, it is unbelievable. And how laser long. propulsion is getting much more interesting and much totally. faster. That's totally, that's really exciting stuff. Where there's good work being done at um, the university in uh, Santa Barbara, California Santa Barbara, where they're able to send a one kilogram package to Mars via laser propulsion in less than a day. Oh, wow. Huh. Wow, that's yeah, cool. That's nuts. So, super awesome. But then there needs to be the receiving end, the <laughs> slowing down. Yeah, the that's catchers. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I got it, so I got it. Oh, no, no, I don't. Yeah. It's gone. That's yeah. gone. That's <coughs> so, that's, so it's incredible for being able to uh, resupply. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the idea of preserving the light of consciousness and I, uh, to getting to the next rock just in case. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I love the Are idea you will go of to Mars sending. Guy? Do, you, do you believe in going to Mars? What yeah, do I, I do. I believe in society uh, expanding there and terraforming and making another home like that. Um, but, and also making homes in space and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I, I also am very aware of needing to have the, the conversations about the potential speciation or bifurcation mm. Mm. of civilization into the wealthy that can tr live right. in space or transit across space right. and the and ones that Matt are Damon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's that. Yeah, 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 that's right. Then Matt Damon stays stays behind. I mean, yeah, I, I like Yeah, that's interesting. I, you know, for me, I think I just I find it so hard to imagine just cuz space is you know, space wants to kill you. You know, space wants to kill you so bad. <laughs> you know, and there's so many ways of doing it. I I've a I worked um, with a fabulous um, data illustrator named Katie Peake at, uh, at Popular Science, and um, uh, her husband studied um, the interstellar medium. So what is space? And, and I was like, what does that even mean? And she said, well, wha if, you, if you drag your hand, if, if, if you were driving through space with your window down and you held a white, and you had white gloves on and you stuck your f hand out, uh, what would it come back like? Uh, and I was like, well, what would it come back uh, like? And she's like, it would come back filthy. Filthy. That supposedly that space is dirty and full of stuff, and so uh -huh. just that alone, like like stardust, is that well, just is? stuff? Like, and and he studies what it all is, and I would I would I couldn't even tell you what what it all is, um, you know. But he, huh. but you know, flying through that for whatever it's going to be, you know, a year yeah. and a half round trip to get to Mars. Uh, oh, there's a lot that can go wrong. I, a I lot that can I go wrong. I love the idea of of Bora Bora. You know, I love. Yeah. I, lo I don't. It's going to take thousands and thousands of years to be able to terraform to that to that degree so um, okay w uh, another quickie before we w before we end yeah um, is this has been great by the way I really appreciate it, it I'm super glad fun. I really enjoyed this I'm yeah, glad totally cool. I'm glad yeah, we'll, cool. we'll have to have more sessions because we only chunked out like three percent of the questions yeah 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 no I love it you know? I love it I'm excited yeah. So, okay, how about maximizing human potential? What are some of your best strategies mm, for man. that? Maximizing human potential. As a species, like mm -hmm. what are we gonna do? Mm -hmm. all, and, and maybe even at the individual level as well, like what about raising wow. a child into the world? Oh my gosh, yeah. who knows? As a father <laughs> of two, I can tell you right now, who <laughs> knows how you do that? You know, I think so much of my life and so much of everybody's life is just muddling through, and then you look back on it and be like, "Oh, that was a cogent narrative. I really <laughs> knew what I was doing." You know, that's hindsight bias. Uh, and so, God knows, I, I live a lot of my life that way. You know, I think that maximizing human potential on Earth. Well, I mean, I will say that like the the trajectory of human sort of of individualized human benefit is is going up. You know, and I think the thing that we sort of forget because we're constantly trying to sell each other stories of doom, gloom, and horror and, and get each other's attention that way mm -hmm. is it's easy to forget that we live in like the peace, uh, p most peaceful, most prosperous age in the history of humanity. Look and at the ubiquity it's, it's getting of food it's getting and better. water and yeah. education and health. Everybody's, you know, yeah. and so that said, there are, excuse me, huge fundamental threats to, to human society uh, and, you know, the habitability of the planet and all kinds of stuff. But you know, we're doing pretty good, you know, for, yeah. for when I drive down the highway and I, and I see all the people around me yeah. stick into their lane, you know, nobody, I mean, obviously there's distracted driving and so forth, but the fact that like, that at any given moment, somebody isn't on fire in that yeah. arrangement, driving along at 60 yeah. miles an hour, you know, the, the, the incredible human mm -hmm. capacity to live 
in peace with other people yep. with obviously huge exceptions and mm -hmm. horrific exceptions. Yes, yes. Um, <coughs> you know, and the and the the amount of localized conflict is going up. That's a real problem right now is that like conflict researchers will tell you that they, you know, a couple decades ago could keep track of the major conflicts in the world and now no, it's really yeah. hard to keep track of because yes. there's so many people falling out amongst themselves. Yes. And that may get worse. Like there's you know, I'm not saying it's all good news, but you know, I think if we if we can redefine this, you know, happiness, certainly in this country, if we can, you know, solve some food problems, because those are coming, mm -hmm. um, and I think if we can get better at understanding, I mean, this is the big one for me, is if, if human beings can get better at understanding the sort of mental patterns that mm -hmm. we follow, yes, uh, if you can become versed in those and even play them off against each other, because that's the thing that biased researchers will tell you, is that the, you know, your, your biases, and again, using that in a kind of scientific sense, not just in the sort of discrimination kind of sense, but your, the shortcuts your brain takes, you can harness those and do all kinds of cool stuff with it. You know, I talk regularly with my daughters, who are four and six, about this, and my, my younger daughter jokes that she's trying to trick her brain into cleaning her room. <laughs> you know, it's awesome. It's so cool. So smart. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and you, and you, you know, you, and when she did that, I, I just was like, yeah, great job. Yes. That's right. That's exactly the kind of thing we're going to be able to do. Yes. So I think if we can learn our capacity for being manipulated and learn the tricks of, of making good, you know, of tricking how our, our system one into making good decisions, that's going to be a really mm -hmm. powerful, powerful thing. Yes. We could do some good stuff with that, you know. So, um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, and I hope that we can get to a point where we're educating more and more children about this on the planet. Because yes. the parent is kind of the god to the child when the child's born into the world and to just hand it off to other people to be responsible That's right. is wrong. That's right. And so to do our best to bring maybe things like evolution and bias and morality and the brain and the heart and the anatomy, spirituality to a young child totally. when they're born into the world might definitely help us maximize um, their potential in a world filled with AI and all the f of the future. That's right. That's S right. I think that too. So, all right. Last question. Yeah. Are we in a computer simulation? Hmm. So, so my feeling about that is uh, not one that has been constructed by some sort of outside force to test us. You know, I don't believe in the zoo idea that we're all kind of mm -hmm. running around as part of some choreographed menagerie. But, you know, like I was describing before this stuff about, you know, generations now of psychologists and neuroscientists have established that our brains are delivering information to us not as it happens, but you know, through an elaborate system that then delivers a feeling of reality into uh, and of the present moment yeah. into our brains. Yeah. And it's true of sight, it's true of hearing, it's mm -hmm. true of, of all forms of co all kinds of uh, cognition that you're you you have a conscious and an unconscious system, you know, for for uh, using your hearing, your sight, your thoughts, mm -hmm. whatever. So, no, I don't believe that we're being, uh, that, that, you know, that, uh, that we're in the matrix, but I do think that we uh, have the, a tremendous, you know, that, that her great talent is not, is not absorbing reality as it really is happening, because it would be too much for our little, for our brains. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have a system for mediating it all before it reaches us, and that system has been really, really useful. Yeah. My only problem is, you know, if we if we uh, aren't careful, we're gonna build systems and more importantly business models and governmental policy and the rest of it that's gonna that's gonna uh, you know that will be a simulation in a way that will drive our decision making for us. You know, we're seeing mm -hmm. that happening now, um, uh, not necessarily through AI specifically, but through the systems of control that human beings build for one another. That stuff's starting, you know, where we're getting really good at gaming each other. Yeah. So we, yep. I think, striking out of, of uh, the simulation, breaking it, getting outside of it, I don't know, I just, I think there's a great human capacity for that. I remember, I remember uh, playing, uh, I was fascinated for a while by the subculture of people who play the, uh, you know, would play the original Call of Duty or those games, you know, where they yeah. go, go into it. Yeah, first person shooters. Yeah. and the rest of it, but any, anything that had an arena that you'd Real go into. Real-time strategy games. Real-time strategy games, anything, yeah. any sort of sandbox kind of game. Yeah. And, and the people who would then, who would then, you know, glitchers, who would then uh, go and try to get out, 
mm. beyond the wall. Yeah, exactly. You know? They try and get beyond those fake <coughs> mountains in the background. Exactly. You know? and, and find these places where they were like skipping out on mm. the reality that this mm -hmm. place had made. And so one thing I like about it is that I think that the more we try to fool each other and the more that we try to manipulate each other, we can take some confidence, or, you know, some reassurance from the idea that human beings love to break the model. They mm -hmm. love to jump outside yeah, the boundaries. Yeah, correct. And so I hope that that is one of, of many things that save us in the future. Yeah. Is our desire to get past the edges of, the, of what we think is reality, and that's kind of also tying it back all the way to what an AI could know about us that we don't know about even ourselves, sure. and then finding that thing on the right. outside. Right, I right, love, I love that, and I think that is definitely a part of the simulation conversation is what is the current manifested world and then what is outside of that that's and right then how could that potentially be advantageous to for uh, my understanding your understanding and our understanding collectively right right our perception system is so fascinatingly uh both advanced in so many ways but also so limited yeah. interestingly and then we have all these augmentations to our perception system that we're working on to be able to see other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum or to be able sure. to feel words on our body, <laughs> yep. all, all yep. these uh, additional kinds of things that uh, I think will get us closer to this, what could potentially end up being a, a supercomputer powered by the star. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, 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 so right, right. Well, here's open, here's open. I like your vision better than my vision. <laughs> and I think, I think that general understanding of a supercomputer powered by a star kind of gives a little bit more reality to what a simulation could actually mm, uh, mm. be like, or, or even nuclear fusion, like a, just being able to fuse atoms and then take more energy out than it, we put in. Mm -hmm. um, that whole process and repeating that for energy is just, uh, uh, that's an abundant source of energy for civilization forever, to travel, the stars, to do whatever we want as well. So um, I think that we covered so, so much. Yeah, so much, I'm thanks again. I'm so grateful yeah, to have had you. Um, so guys, Jacob Ward is, on Twitter, uh, we're gonna put his link inside of the description that you guys can find. Also, we would like to, again, ask you to check out Complicated on Audible. It's super duper good. Please do, I appreciate yes, it. Yep. Yes, yep. Thank um, you. Hacking Your Mind will be out soon. Um, we want to thank our director and producer, Ron Vargas, for being epic. Uh, crushing it behind the TriCaster and RoboCams. We want to thank uh, River Studios for their beautiful space. Um, they're amazing as well. We'll throw their link in the description. And guys, uh, if you guys had a good time, please do give us a like, give us a comment, give us a subscribe, uh, share it with other people. We're on Patreon, so if you want to support us, please become a patron. You get tons of great benefits. You get access to knowing who our guests are ahead of time, access to exclusive content, access to events ahead of time, um, all this kind of exclusivity that we'd love for you to join the conversation uh, with us on. Again, I'm Alan Saki, and this has been Simulation with Jake Ward, and we'll catch you guys soon. Thanks, man. Thank you very much. Yeah.